Okay, so um, just settle into your seats and uh, uh, refrain from bag rustling and computer tapping just for a brief moment while we revive the motivation. May all sentient beings possess happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings not be separated from happiness that is free of suffering. May they abide with equanimity, free from attachment, hatred, and indifference. Okay. So we don't need to review last Wednesday because you had Purim and uh, we're just going to go back into the four immeasurable thoughts and today we're going to be looking specifically at compassion and I think that when we look at compassion we need to be very specific when we talk about like the parameters and kind of the edges and you know how it is exactly even though we know experientially in daily life, compassion mixes together with many other complementary things, and that's a good thing usually. Um, I think when we're talking about it intellectually, it's good to be precise, even though life is not so precise, even though life is messy. Because in getting the precision intellectually, we can be a lot more specific and fine-tuned about building depth and about really confronting the things that have blocked our compassion traditionally or have made our compassion too exclusive. And when our compassion is too exclusive or too specific to just certain people under just certain conditions with just certain times, we know that means there is also attachment and attachment can so easily co-opt our best intentions. So I think it's really important to remind ourselves that just because you think the activities you're doing are compassionate activities does not mean that your motivation is compassion. Just because your words and behaviors and work and like performance is compassionate doesn't mean it's compassion. And obviously the course level is just hypocrisy or self-denial or something of that ilk. But more deeply, we might not realize the reasons why our compassion is not as effective as we want it to be, or why we get tired in response to a good inner behavior or good outer activity. We wonder why we're tired or disillusioned or it's not somehow resonating or expanding the way that we want. So, um, so let's aim for some intellectual precision. And then when you're back in your daily life, hopefully it can collaborate with all the other good tools that you have. Okay, so just to ground ourselves in the context, we're talking about how in Mahayana Tibetan Buddhist practices, pretty much all prayers and meditations start with the same preliminary motivation prayers. We usually start with refuge in Bodhicitta and you guys have talked a lot about refuge in bodhicitta on your Wednesday class, and for the most part, that conversation is done for now. Um, moving forward, you're going to be looking a lot more at bodhicitta and the other perfections, um, those things related to bodhicitta, particularly patience. So bodhicitta and patience are going to be the new topic for your Wednesday classes. So then for your Monday classes, we're continuing on with the four immeasurables, and this is the second prayer in almost all Mahayana Buddhist practices. So we've done love, and now we're looking at compassion. The short form being, may all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. And of course, there's a lot of layers, many, many layers to what that means. So other times just compassion itself comes up in Buddhism, not immeasurable compassion, but just generally compassion, is when you're building bodhicitta in the sevenfold cause and effect, 
number five and number six are obviously related to compassion. And it's a sequential process where you're building a kind of sense of gratitude and appreciation and respect and wish to offer something to these kind mother sentient beings. So having wished them happiness, then you shift to wishing them freedom from suffering. And then the great compassion, which is wishing them freedom from suffering and you're taking personal responsibility to help that come about. So immeasurable compassion is similar and related, but it's not exactly the same thing. Although they obviously go together very nicely. So in identifying it, we have to look at this near enemy, far enemy dichotomy again, because it's a useful framework. So again, near enemies look like compassion, but are not compassion. And last week we were talking about these. Pity, placation, sympathy, attached problem solving, uh, empathic distress. Some of these are not that bad. Some of these are terrible, but they, none of them are compassion, but they might look like compassion. So the big thing I want to look at here is there is no such thing as compassion fatigue. And the reason why I'm pointing this out is because in a lot of therapeutic circles, especially in America, this framework is presented. There are workshops on, on overcoming compassion fatigue, aren't there? I don't know how prevalent they are in Israel, but particularly California, where I just was, it was all about compassion fatigue and overcoming compassion fatigue. And it's a misnomer. In English, um, a misnomer, it's like it doesn't mean that. From a Buddhist perspective, real compassion does not make you tired. If you are tired, it's because of other things. It's not to say that bearing witness to suffering doesn't have things that can creep in that will lead to burnout. Of course, that's our experience in life. We know that. But to frame it as compassion fatigue misunderstands the power of actual compassion. So I think it's really important that we confront and contradict this kind of pop psychology presentation that is all over the place. From a Buddhist perspective, no such thing as compassion fatigue. Okay, so I'm gonna go a little deeper into that. So again, if we are fatigued, it is never compassion itself that made us tired. So then if there is no such thing as compassion fatigue, then what is it <laughs> that makes us tired when witnessing suffering? All right, so just take a minute and sit with that. What is it that makes us tired when we're witnessing suffering day after day, either with our friends or our family or your patients? What are the things that wear us out? So please share. <laughs> What makes you tired? Maybe identification. Yep, identification, classic one. Classic one. Yep. <laughs> Various trauma responses. Yep, you're relating too much and now all of your stuff is bubbling up. Yeah. Yeah, what, what else makes you tired? <laughs> Do you acknowledge that you get tired or are you in denial about your level of fatigue and burnout? <laughs> Do you so identify as a worker and that productivity is itself a virtue that you won't even acknowledge your own fatigue? And so you're tired, but you're pretending not to be. I know there are some workaholics amongst you, I'm guessing. So the first step, I guess, is to even acknowledge that there is a tiredness that can occur potentially. So when that occurs, what is it? And I guess the disclaimer is, it's not a failing. It's not a deficiency. There's nothing wrong with you if your work has an element that brings fatigue. The important thing is to assume that will be the case because we are not Buddhas yet. And then to clearly identify, what is it? Because if we blame compassion, that's very problematic for our spiritual path. It's not the compassion, it's something else that's making us tired. So what is it? Over-identification for sure. What else? 
when we feel not beneficial. Say it again. When we feel not beneficial, not feel yeah. Beneficial. Yep, like it's not working. Yes. Yeah. You have the best of intentions, you have good strategies, and it's just doesn't seem to help. Yeah, that definitely can make us tired. Yep. <laughs> to have open ended, without expectations, just free flowing, good work, and it lands how it lands without any expectations or attachment. That's a very advanced state that we don't usually settle into as regularly as we would like, although I'm sure sometimes we do. We're offering open ended. Here's the best of what I can offer to alleviate your suffering. It will either help or it won't, but I'm not in control of all of those conditions. When you feel like you are, there's a tension in the effort and that tension in trying to get something to work can be part of the fatigue. Maybe if you don't have the wisdom that everything is uh, impermanent, um, or maybe if, what is the intention? Yeah. Our activities, and if and maybe we can be uh, with others, but we are thinking about this ourselves. Yep. Yeah, hundred percent. The mixed motivation or the unclear motivation. Yeah. For sure. And we are overload, overload. Yeah. Over, over, uh, over work. Yeah. Not uh, listening to our capacity. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's a really important word, capacity. It's like your capacity is not a permanent, finite thing, but right now it does exist at a certain place. And if you keep pushing past that, of course you're going to get tired but if you're creating boundaries and creating pacing and creating skillful strategies that work with your capacity you won't wear yourself out but sometimes that has a, a trigger for our pride because we think our capacity is more than it is so then we set up a schedule that is bigger than we can cope with and then we're tired or disappointed or resentful or whatever and those are all tiring mental states. Maybe also when we put the extra effort in trying to be compassionate. It doesn't come uh, uh, smoothly. Like you're forcing it. Yeah, or we're trying to overcome uh, egocentricity. Or, so it's a good intention, but if it doesn't come still uh, effortless, it may be tiring. Yeah, and that's an interesting one because there's there's a type of effort that is enriching and there's a type of effort that is exhausting. And knowing the balance personally and specifically is a work for our whole life, but to understand that there are some types of effort where you notice your heart is blocked, your compassion is not flowing freely, and actually some effort to address those blockages and those resistances is really fascinating and makes you curious and open about why this person or why this time and that inner examination opens you back up. But then there's another approach where you're just trying to force it because you want to be good or you're forcing it because it's the right thing to do and you're pushing through all of the things that stand in the way of it without addressing those things. And that, of course, is doomed to failure or backlash or tiredness. So it's not effort so much itself, it's the approach to the effort. Because, of course, from a Buddhist perspective, things like love and compassion, while natural to a human being, are also tools to develop. So if you have a certain level of love and compassion, that is not your fate for your whole life to stay at that level. It's a skill, it's a tool to be built and developed. You can be more compassionate, more loving by using effort mentally. So um, while they are natural states to human beings, they are still tools to be developed and increased. And so we don't wanna be passive about it. But I think there's something important in what you're saying about don't force it 
or if it's not flowing smoothly, what is that about? But uh, <coughs> I, re I reject the idea that it's effort itself that makes you tired because some types of effort are very enlivening. Maybe it's a, a lack of self-compassion. Yeah, but yeah, absolutely. Towards us. Yep. Yeah, you're skipping a step. You know, you say all sentient beings except me. <laughs> And all sentient beings includes you, so don't skip you in the all sentient beings. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, that kind of thing is very common to people who were brought up particularly um, Christian Catholic. I don't know how prevalent it is if you were brought up Jewish, but I, I have a feeling that there is also that tendency towards martyrdom in some facets of your upbringing, certainly was in ours where you're supposed to be selfless in the colloquial sense meaning skip yourself in being of benefit to others neglect yourself in being of benefit to others which from a buddhist perspective is is nonsense and not skillful and why would you do that you're a sentient being too but it almost feels like it's not pure compassion unless you jump over your own needs which is silly but might be how we were brought up. Is that is that ringing true for some of you? Did some of you get trained in that way, encouraged to be martyrs? You have a grandmother somewhere? <laughs> it's interesting, yes. So the things that make us tired are not compassion, but they may be related to our work that we brand as compassionate. So, um, so I'll just list a few, and I guess as I list them, see which ones are you. And some of them might not be, you know, this is just kind of a general idea common to humans. So the first one is we've pushed past our ability for sustained focus, right? So you have compassion, but you don't have concentration. So it might be that your compassion is doing quite well, but your ability to focus for a long period of time is something that is in process and growing and you've actually stretched it too many hours. Another one is empathic distress. So you're having some sort of empathic experience of being with and your nervous system is getting upregulated and you're getting too much over identification too much into their despair without seeing the way out of it. Classic one, of course, is bad boundaries, right? So in Buddhism, boundaries are fine. We just don't want them to be barriers. And obviously boundaries are an inner conversation with yourself about what your capabilities are and decisions you make about that. They're not so much things you impose on other people, their decisions you're making for yourself to have practical pacing. So then together with that are things like unrealistic expectations. How much progress do you think is possible? How much effectiveness do you have? That is very variable. It really depends on not just you, not just the other person, but countless other conditions around them. And classic is burnout. You've pushed too hard, too fast for too long, and you're starting to shut down. And then there's short sightedness, which I think is a really common one where you're a little bit narrow in how development looks. And that development is a giant long term lifelong process and you're wanting some sort of obvious tangible progress immediately in the moment. And then another one is loss of faith, and this could be loss of faith in your own abilities or loss of faith in the tools that you've been using. And so that kind of sadness creeps in or that disillusionment and that starts to wear you out. So as you look at that list, would you would you add any others? It's a classic list. I'm sure you've thought of these things before. 
What else makes you tired? You also need some, um, something that uh, nourishes or holds you, like a uh, theory or people. people. Like lack of supervision or lack of mentorship or lack of support, yes. like that? Yeah, or, or theory that you believe in or something that, uh, that, you can, that you can hold to or that you feel that holds you. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe something that Rafferi said at the beginning, uh, the, the lack of along with the compassion, if it goes by itself, then the existing uh, so, Yeah. Without wisdom, it's not exactly... Yeah, wisdom is so important. So, you know, I'm sure that in your training before you even became analysts in whatever work you were doing before, it's burnout is a very common conversation. But I think that in society, it's so common to blame the outside world and to blame societal pressure for why you're so tired. You know, blame the patriarchy, blame capitalism, blame, you know, and all of those things are conditions but we're the ones that chose to buy into them. And of course, there's a lot of peer pressure and there's a lot of expectations. And then there's practical considerations about resources and finance and things like that. But there's a lot more choice than we allow ourselves. We have a lot more power to make decisions about where we give our energy than we think we do. So by taking a moment to not blame society and not blame conditions and not blame your schedule and not blame this and this externally, you actually take the power back for what decisions you do have. So, um, so that's really, of course, the Buddhist thought on so many things is, yes, of course, there are conditions and conditions do play a part. But the main thing is your mental attitude. The main thing is how you're talking to yourself about your conditions what you've decided they mean to you, what you've chosen to emphasize. So kind of taking the power back. So when we look at then the near enemies and far enemies, the far enemies are so easy, it's just catching them. So the opposites of compassion that actively block it. We have hate, we have anger, we have malice, we have vindictive retaliation. And just remember that anger in a Buddhist context means the wish to harm. So it's not just being upset, it's wishing to harm. And the wish to harm is obviously the opposite of compassion. So you'll go through a lot about anger and patience on Wednesdays. So when you're identifying these within yourself, it really requires radical self-honesty and humility. You have to be so true with what you're saying to yourself and so humble about your abilities, which doesn't mean humiliated, which doesn't mean looking down, which doesn't mean beating yourself up. It means you're just very clear eyed about what your capacity is, what your triggers are. And so you ask yourself really probing questions like, if I feel taken advantage of or taken for granted, did I actually overcommit myself and or overestimate my abilities? So it feels like people are taking things from you. Yeah, they're, they're asking too much. They're pushing you too much. Well, you have to agree for that to actually happen. So did your pride say, I am a wonderful, helpful person, therefore I will commit so much, when in fact that's only the amount you can commit on your best day when everything is going smoothly, but it's not sustainable. So when you feel taken advantage of or taken for granted asking yourself, did I actually overcommit? The other piece is if you feel resentment 
or cynicism, burnout, disillusionment? Did I actually underestimate the time and energy an interaction or process would require? So the tiredness is coming from overestimation or underestimation. It's coming from a lack of self-honesty and a lack of humility. So when you have self-honesty and humility, your pace is gonna be more practical. And I know that this is so obvious, but asking yourself questions like this is compassion. This is compassion to yourself, is to ask yourself these questions regularly. Yeah, compassion to yourself is not going to the spa, is not getting a massage, is not eating chocolate cake. Compassion to yourself is asking yourself these deep questions about pacing. When you have this radical self-honesty and humility, it can lead to humor and warmth and relaxation and flexibility, as well as practical pacing and boundaries. So taking responsibility for your own thoughts, responses, and choices can initially be uncomfortable, but are far more empowering in the long run. Again, very self-evident to people who live an introspective, examined life, but to ask yourself, what are the ways I can notice if I've gone off track? And often the first thing is you've lost your sense of humor. If you've lost your sense of humor, you've lost a type of flexibility of mind. Yeah, you're veering into burnout. You know, I mean, sometimes it's simple things like when the house becomes messy, you think you're bad when in fact the house becoming messy is a sign that you've overcommitted yourself elsewhere. For example, another one is that you've gotten a tightness and a rigidity and you get too specific about what needs to happen in your life. Yeah, you get tight. And if people aren't doing things a certain way, it really annoys you. Whereas when you're in a more spacious, more actually compassionate space, a lot more things are fine with you. You can say there are many correct ways. So it's just kind of asking yourself the questions of, for me as an individual, what are the signs that I'm tipping into the negative state when I'm straying from actual compassion? So there is no such thing as compassion fatigue, which is not to say self-care or self-compassion isn't good, useful, or needed. They are. So this is just review from the first week. To clarify what is immeasurable compassion, it's the wish for sentient beings to be free from suffering. It understands the potential for freedom while bearing witness to suffering. So then not compassion is when you say things like, your suffering makes me suffer for you and with you to show you that I care. That is not compassion. And compassion is also confused with regular empathy, sympathy, pity, or empathic distress. So I think it's very important to ask ourselves, when are we getting empathic distress? but calling it compassion. So for example, you're watching the news, right? You're watching the news and you're seeing horrible things happening, maybe in Russia or something or in Ukraine, and your heart goes to these poor people and you think, oh my gosh, this is tragic. If you're starting to get upregulated, if your nervous system is starting to get agitated, if you're crying, that is not compassion, okay? Nor is it practical nor is it useful, nor is it helping Ukraine, nor is it helping the Russian people have clarity. It's just empathic distress. And it's normal and it's very natural, but it is not necessary, nor is it what we're aiming for. But some people are so conditioned to thinking compassion looks like I will suffer with you rather than I will bear witness actively, attentively to your suffering while at the same time knowing you are not your suffering, your suffering is not permanent, your potential is freedom. But of course, if you're just bearing witness to suffering without holding awareness, 
of the potential for freedom, you will be exhausted. Of course you will. Your emotions are all upregulated, all tangled, and maybe part of you even likes the drama of it. But that's not what we're aiming for. Okay, so this is the thing to hear. It's a dual focus, <laughs> compassion. Yeah, compassion's a dual focus, two things at once. You're, free, you're focusing on freedom indicates a belief in impermanence and self-directed positive change, as well as the Buddha nature of all beings. Witnessing suffering understands the common and likely immediate conditions, nature, nurture, etc., as well as deep causation, karma. So you're holding both things at once. And when you hold both things at once, the only thing that will get tired is your lack of concentration. But the compassion itself is very sustainable, very enriching. And so the first part of these is in common with secular views. You don't have to be Buddhist to think that things change moment to moment and that people can have self-directed positive change. You don't have to be Buddhist to understand the common and likely immediate conditions for people's suffering. So you can hold these two, even if you have no Buddhist beliefs. And then the Buddhist specific views are the add-ons of understanding Buddha nature of all beings, their potential for perfection, their potential to be free from suffering, their potential for infinite wisdom and compassion themselves, and then the deep causation of karma. So those are Buddhist specific. So, you know, there's a way of viewing this that works for everyone, whether it's the whole picture or not. Okay, so you have belief that freedom is possible and in everyone's potential. You're witnessing suffering without identifying the person as they're suffering. Two things at once. So all of which implies a sense of responsibility for bringing about the former, diminishing the latter. And all of which implies an equanimous, immeasurable attitude that leaves no one out. And all of which is deeply supported by an understanding of emptiness and dependent arising. So to support compassion with an understanding of emptiness and dependent arising, we think sentient beings are empty of inherent existence, as are their suffering. They only relatively exist. Suffering and how significant or strong it's, it is seen as depends on causes and conditions, parts and context, and a mind's imputation on a valid basis. They do not ultimately exist. So there's the deep philosophical way of looking at this that you remember from tenants, but there's also just a surface basic understanding that you've always had, which is context. But understanding context is something that we forget. So sometimes when we're bearing witness to someone's suffering, we assume how bad it is because that's how bad it would be for us. But for them, it's no big deal. Or for them, it's 10 times worse. So we have all these built-in assumptions about how bad the situation is or how deeply the person suffers. And we have to really examine those assumptions and come to people with fresh eyes. And I think that when we're looking at how things are impermanent is very helpful because part of what gets us trapped is forgetting that everyone's suffering changes every single second. Even if they're suffering for many years, it, you know, it has peaks and valleys and waves and colors and it's changing constantly. But if you feel like you're looking at this one peak moment of pain as an eternity, it starts to feel unbearable. And, and I'm sure you learned this in your you know, early training, but anyone that we're trying to help and support had a whole life before they met us and lived this long without us. They don't need us, right? We might be of benefit, we might be of help, 
we might be an excellent tool or support, but to kind of like have the correct amount of responsibility where we want to be of benefit and relieve the suffering of all sentient beings, but we also understand perspective. How significant are we as an individual to their life? How powerful a condition are we actually? So putting yourself in the correct perspective comes back to this idea of humility. And humility really helps for practical pacing. If you think for some people, I change their life. For some people, they don't even remember my name. It's not about me, right? And when it's not about you, the pressure is off. You just do your best and let go and do your best and let go. And it's about your inner development of more and more consistently doing your best, going more deeply with it. And that is enriching, whether it has an obvious impact or not. Because that kind of momentum builds the sort of strength where you are able to help more people in a more radiating way. But, you know, it's very unclear to us the significance we actually had on people. And it doesn't really matter. It's not our business. It's their life. Give them responsibility for their life. Just offering them the best you can. So detachment in Buddhism is very easily misunderstood as disengagement or not caring or being somehow passive. We are all in for sentient beings. Every second of every day, we want them freedom from suffering. We want them to have happiness, theoretically. Yeah, we're working on it. But that doesn't mean that we're all up in their business with the little fiddly details of their life. That's kind of superficial and beside the point. We're going to the depths because that's where we can have the greatest impact. And going to the depths is actually more sustainable and more fun and more effective, more importantly, than kind of being all fiddly up in everybody's business and just trying to have them have a good day. That's nice, but it's not the point. And I think it's a misunderstanding people will have when they finally have a Buddhist guru, a real Lama, they think the Lama is going to like take care of them and like hold their hand on the spiritual path. Probably not. They're going to just tell them what parts of their thinking are nonsense and rubbish, very point blank, very directly, and then ignore them. <laughs> and that is a far more compassionate thing at that level of your path. When you're new in your path, you need handholding and comfort and regular conversation and discussion and elaboration. But the more mature you get, the less of that sweetness you need in that kind of obvious way. And the less kind of specific to your daily life do you need it. They tell you the big concepts, the big picture, you take responsibility to apply it to your daily life. So do with that information what you will, but just some context. So then we get ideas like what Dogan says, which is to know the self is to forget the self. And below that is just a biography you can read later. So in practicing compassion, think really deeply about this line. To know the self is to forget the self. So we'll unpack that a little bit. So a Zen commentary, a really good one I like, says people study the Buddha way, but often don't study the self. If we don't study the self, it is not practice. To study the self is to forget the self. What does this mean? Look now. Practice while holding on to the self is not the Buddha way. When we are young, we tend to misunderstand this. We may think that we have aspiration because we have the self, but this is not right. We should completely forget the self. So here is one of the many ways Zen gets misunderstood. It's not about neglect. It's about forgetting the self that is viewed by self-grasping, which is a self that doesn't exist at all. The conventional self, okay, no worries, but we don't even know the conventional self. We only know the facade. 
we know the object of negation. So forget that one, it was never there. That's the one to forget. And when he's saying when we are young or immature in our practice, we might think that the reason we have ambition, ambition to be of benefit, ambition in our career, ambition of any type, aspiration to help, is because of how you view the self, that that self is gonna be the helper. And if you don't view that self as the helper, why would you have the urge to help? And it's a really good question. It's something really good to sit with, but it's something that I think we can come to release over time. So unpacking that a little bit more, to know the self is to forget the self. So maybe it's easier to put it in more secular terms. So we got Bob Dylan, right? We love Bob Dylan. Remember my back pages, right? 1964, I was not in this body. I was in a whole other body. I don't remember. Verse six says, yes, my guard stood hard when abstract threats too noble to neglect deceived me into thinking I had something to protect. Good and bad, I define these terms, quite clear, no doubt, somehow. Ah, but I was so much older then, I'm younger than that now. And this is what we're talking about, is that the, the kind of immature mind has a cynicism or a black and white thinking that creates these false barriers, that creates the illusion that there's something to protect. But what are these abstract threats? And you say to yourself, they're too noble to neglect. I'm being harmed this way and this way, and I need to set my boundaries and my standards and have all of my, I don't know, weapons against humanity. But who is trying to hurt you really? And so this is something to sit with. Or you could make it more contemporary, right? We've got Lady Gaga. And she says, turning up emotional faders, like through medicine, keep repeating self-hating phrases. I have heard enough of these voices, almost like I have no choice. My biggest enemy is me ever since day one. So this is clear to us, but we have to make it more deeply clear to us. So if we shift back to Buddhism, we look at Pema Chodron, the self here, now we're shifting to self-cherishing. So this refers to how we try to protect ourselves by fixating. How we put up walls so that we won't have to feel discomfort or lack of resolution. So that notion of self-cherishing refers to the erroneous belief that there could only be comfort and no discomfort, or the belief that there could only be happiness and no sadness or the belief that there could just be good and no bad. And when we are so involved with trying to protect ourselves, we're unable to see the pain in another's face. Self-grasping is ego fixating and grasping. It ties our hearts, our shoulders, our head, our stomach into knots. We can't open. Everything is in a knot. When we begin to open, we can see others and we can be there for them. But to the degree that we haven't worked with our own fear, we are going to shut down when others trigger our fear. So this false way of viewing the self, whether it's a self-cherishing view or a self-grasping view, creates the illusion that you must protect something that isn't there and you become tight and knotted and clenched and tense and the heart is shut down and the possibilities of the mind are few. They're more instinctual, they're more automatic, they're less considered, they're less creative. So when we're thinking about that feeling of, I need to protect myself, is it healthy boundary about pacing or is it a false illusionary idea, that tension that we create when we get overstretched and we've triggered our self-cherishing even more. So come back to what you know about afflictions being that which makes the mind unpeaceful. If there is an agitation there, 
Try not to make choices from that place if you can. When there's agitation there, just be curious and let it roll through and then make your decisions when you're clearer. But operating from that place of agitation that feels like I must protect, I must protect, actually isolates you, separates you from the herd, disconnects you. And then you have more suspicion and more resentment and more paranoia, more fear, and you feel less related to humanity. To know yourself is to forget yourself. This is to say that when we make friends with ourselves, we no longer have to be so self-involved. It's a curious twist. Making friends with ourselves is a way of not being so self-involved anymore. So you're thoroughly looking after your relative self. You're thoroughly looking after your basic needs. And because of that, you're not so worried about it. You're not so self-referent. You can really be there for other people because you're okay. So then when Dogen says to forget yourself is to become enlightened by all things, which is the next part of that stanza, when we are not so self-involved, we begin to realize that the world is speaking to us all of the time. Every plant, every tree, every animal, every person, every car, every airplane is speaking to us, teaching us, awakening us, but not in a passive way. We have to be like leaning in and listening for that. And to be able to listen for that, we can't be so self-involved. In developing a measurable compassion, we seek to cherish others and to be free from self-cherishing. So then just a reminder, self-cherishing is a deeply ingrained thought that cherishes the welfare of your own self above all others and makes you oblivious to others' well-being. It, this is one of the twin demons that lie within our hearts and serve as the source of all misfortune and downfall the other twin demon being grasping at selfhood. These two thoughts, self-cherishing and self-grasping, are the primary focus of combat in the mind training practice. So the form of self-cherishing enemy discussed in mind training, the Lojong tradition of Mahayana Buddhism, is the negative one. The positive one is just looking after yourself in a practical way. Negative self-cherishing is this one that seeks one's own welfare and that of those we consider us or mine with indifference to others, even at the expense of others. So colloquially, we might say self-absorbed, self-centered, selfish, but it actually goes deeper and is more fundamental than those descriptions. It is present even when we are being good self-grasping fuels it. So remember that self-grasping is this instinctually believing in the intrinsic existence of your own self <clears throat> as well as of the external world. Self here means a substantial, truly existent or inherently existent identity. The wisdom that realizes emptiness eliminates this self-grasping. So the self that we're talking about can be any number of levels, but don't make it too simple or too what you already know. To say self-cherishing is the same as selfishness is an oversimplification. Because self-cherishing is there in a very subtle way all of the time for ordinary beings. Your kindest day, your most compassionate day, still has colorings of the self-cherishing thought of ego satisfaction, of identifying as a helper or a good person. It's only very progressed down the path where we've actually eliminated self-cherishing. So to un understand it's very insidious and it's so affiliated with things like the eight worldly concerns, with pride, with status ideas, and that our reasons for doing the best things are not pure. And that is something that we all need to acknowledge and be honest about. Otherwise, we'll never move through it out the other end to something better. 
So your best day is still contaminated by self-cherishing. That can be kind of disillusioning, but it's not forever, it's not fate. You'll move through it, and you already are. But knowing that about yourself with, again, that radical self-honesty, you can also see it in others, and it helps you not be so attached to them. You realize their motivations are always mixed. The nicest person on the best day, their motivation is not purely to benefit you. They've got self-interest always there. So then you're not so like attached. You think, yes, there's something in it for them too. Gives you a bit of spaciousness, gives you some objectivity. So we don't wanna to be too romantic about sentient beings. Yeah, sentient beings are full of innate ignorance and all of the symptoms of it. The afflictions are not lovable. <laughs> they are not lovable. People are lovable, but their afflictions are not lovable. And knowing that really can help break the spell of attachment. In Buddhism, renunciation, the determination to be free from samsara, that's what self-compassion is. Self-compassion is renunciation. So the best act of self-care, compassion and kindness towards oneself would be to remove our suffering and the causes of suffering. And this means having the long view that works on both method and wisdom and de-emphasizes samsara symptoms relief by going to the root of suffering, which is grasping at the self. So we have to remember emptiness, right? This is review, but just I still hear some mistakes in the way you talk about it. So according to the perfection of wisdom scriptures of Mahayana Buddhism, all things and events, including our own existence, are devoid of any independent, substantial, and intrinsic reality. This emptiness of independent existence is phenomena's ultimate mode of being the way they actually are. The theory of emptiness is most systematically developed in the writings of the second century Indian thinker Nagarjuna, who demonstrated the emptiness of all things and events, both external and internal, through logical reasoning. Since our deeply ingrained tendency is to perceive and grasp a substantial reality in all phenomena, we engender a cycle of conceptualization, objectification, grasping, and bondage. Only through bringing an end to this cycle, Nagarjuna argues, can we begin the path to liberation. Yeah, was there a question? Yes. Can you elaborate a little bit about the connection between uh, renunciation and self-compassion? Okay. Well, do you remember what renunciation is? The determination to be free? Um, right? It's breaking the spell of samsara, right? Like, what's the nicest thing you can do for yourself? Get out of cyclic existence. The nicest thing you can do for yourself is not to go on holiday. That's a symptom relief. That's putting a band-aid on a deep cut, right? It'll soothe it a little bit. Sometimes it's all we can do. But renunciation is not believing the lies of our grasping at inherent existence. Renunciation is determining to be free from our patterns. Samsara is not out there. Samsara is us contaminated by karma and disturbing emotions. So that's why we're in pain, that's why we're in confusion, and that's why we hurt each other. So self-compassion is developing renunciation. So you're not so lost in the everyday nonsense of everyday life, but you still are in everyday life and working to benefit all. It's having the biggest picture. What do we want for all sentient beings? We want their evolution. We want their development towards compassion and wisdom. We don't want to reinforce their animal instincts, their territorialness, their resentfulness, their grasping, all of these base instincts. We can grow out of them, but we only will if we decide to. It's self-directed evolution. And so renunciation is an offering to yourself to say, I'm going to stop the patterns that hurt myself. I'm going to stop the things that hurt myself.
It's just having a big picture view rather than a small picture view. You know that when you're in a small picture, a kind thing for yourself might be your favorite food. Like it might be feel nurturing and kind to give yourself chocolate cake. But if you have the big picture view, you know that actually all of that sugar and all of that carbohydrates is going to make you agitated and then tired and then put on weight that you can't really afford to because now we're all middle aged. Right. So the big picture you knows that's not the comfort my habit says it is. And yet we're so habituated to it and it does work a little bit. So renunciation is saying maybe I'll have the chocolate cake, maybe I won't, but it's never been the source of comfort and happiness. It's just been a condition. I could use healthier conditions and have a more expansive attitude. And that would be far kinder to myself than these tiny crumbs of samsaric happiness that I chase all day. So it's an important link to make the relationship between self-compassion and renunciation. And so then if we're helping others, we're having compassion for others, we also help them with their renunciation. And so together with that, we want to destroy these twin enemies of self-nourishing and self-grasping for their sake, as well as your own. And so you ask yourself, is my compassionate attitude actual compassion? Do I only wish the ego gratification of helping? Do I only care about their surface symptoms relief? And so this really boils down to knowing the difference between being self-aware without being self-conscious, self-aware being having conscious knowledge of one's own character and feelings, self-conscious being undue awareness of oneself, one's appearance or one's actions. So we want to be self-aware without being self-conscious. And really when we're looking at the Buddhist view, we're talking about the two wings, method and wisdom. They're developed separately. We try and bring them together whenever we can through cherishing others, leading to actual bodhicitta, eventually Buddhahood, then through the wisdom realizing emptiness, leading to the end of suffering and its causes altogether. So sit with that <laughs> and we'll dedicate. All sentient beings who, although self and all appearances are dharmadhatu by nature, have not realized it thus. I shall endow with happiness and the causes of happiness I shall separate from suffering and the causes of suffering, and I shall set in equanimity the state of well-being free from attachment, aversion, and partiality. Okay, so we'll all see you tonight. And uh, the PowerPoint will be in your email soon, so you can have a look through it again, and we'll keep going next week with compassion. Bye. Bye.